Good morning. Good morning. Why don't we stand this morning as we begin our worship? Maria? Yeah. Whenever you're ready. <laughs>
His name is wonderful. We know that because somebody has told us about him. But there are many peoples across the world who still do not know about our wonderful God, our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we think about the people in Brazil, how are they going to hear? Well, David and Anna Hartman are going to tell them. Uh, we have just taken on David and Anna Hartman as new missionaries here for our congregation. They're visiting with us today, and so I'm going to have one or both of them come up and give us an update on where things are at. Thank you. It is really good to be here this morning, and we were very excited to hear that we have a partnership with you, and to be going as you know, just two individuals dependent on God, but sent by you all and so many others. That's, that's where there's power. And your prayer to our faithful God, it's his, his enablement that even gives us hope of success, you know. It's all because of him. So thank you for partnering with us. Uh, it's also exciting to, to just update you on how God's provided. We've reached 93% of our, our recommended monthly budget. That's only because of God and so many who are responding to him. So thank you for your part. We have tickets now. In fact, God, God gave us a friend who found this incredible price. Oh, half the price of, or half of what we set aside for tickets is what we ended up paying for, for them. It's just amazing how God is going before us. So praise God, and it's great to be with you. I enjoyed sitting in on the end of Joshua. What an encouragement. And so thank you for you all. I do hope that you will uh, be faithfully praying for David and Anna as they head down to work with the Yanomami people. The first uh, year or so, they're going to be doing some language school so that David probably could pick it up in a week, uh, everything he remembered as a kid, but uh, it will be a brand new experience for Anna. So uh, especially pray for them with transition with kids and uh, setting up their new home. Say, well, how would I know what's going on? Well, we'll keep you informed, but a reminder down on the South Hallway are missionary updates uh, from each of our missionaries. We've already got a board for David and Anna and have their most recent email. So it's there. You can pick it up and take it home. Take one from each of the missionaries so that you can not just pray, Lord bless all the missionaries, but pray in specific ways for them. So it's a joy to have David and Anna with us today. Their kids are also with us. They're in the nursery. All right, now here's the, the $10 question. Anybody who can tell us the name of their three kids? Yeah. Uh, Tyrus. Tyrus. Dea. Dea. And Zachariah. 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 Yep. Very good. Very good. So as you pray for the missionaries, don't forget to pray for their kids as well, because they often have a very difficult time too. Uh, this is the chance we have now in our worship service where we give back to the Lord. He has provided well for us. He has blessed us abundantly. And it's our chance to honor him by giving back as an act of worship the first portion of all he's blessed us with. So as the ushers come forward, let's pray together. Lord, it is a joy and a delight to be here in your presence today. And as we give these gifts, we give them to you. Not just to the church or to meet the bills. We give them to worship you, God to tell you that we love you, to tell you that we want to be faithful to you, and we pray that you would use what is given for your glory. May you be honored by how we give faithfully, and may you, in turn, be able to pour back your blessing upon us as a church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
remind you that tonight we'll be meeting together at 6 o'clock, have a potluck dinner together, and then afterwards do a Bible study together. We're in the service this morning. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 14. Uh, we'll get there in a little bit. Acts chapter 15, though, we're going to look at tonight. So if you, if you say, well, I wonder what comes next after this morning, you've got to come back tonight to find out as we look at Acts chapter 15. But uh, last Sunday night, we looked at... Uh, we had, with Memorial Day weekend, we looked at memorials. We talked about two memorials that we use in the church to remember what our God has done for us. One being baptism, the other communion. And uh, today we have the chance to take communion together. We take uh, the bread and the juice. We remember the body and blood of Jesus that was given for us. Here at Bethel, we have an open communion. You don't have to be a member of the church to participate. We ask that you have made that commitment to follow the Lord and receive his salvation. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians and explains it to us. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is a joy that we can proclaim the Lord's death. The, pro, to proclaim the fact that Jesus Christ has died. Because he died for us. So as we proclaim his death, we are proclaiming the fact that he died in our place. He took our sins upon himself. That we may receive the righteousness of Christ that we could be reconciled to our God. It is a joy, it is a celebration. And so we invite you to join with us as we take the bread and the cup together this morning. I'll ask those who are helping to come forward at this time. The disciples were meeting with Jesus for the Passover. They were celebrating, they were used to taking bread and remembering how God had provided for their daily needs. But Jesus said that the bread would represent his body. And so this morning we take a piece of bread as it is passed and we remember the body of Christ that was given for us. He could have called 10,000 angels, as the song says. Jesus said to his disciples, don't you think I could ask my father and he'd send legions of angels down to take him off the cross? He could have. He chose to die. It was his will. He wasn't forced to die. He died because he was following his father's will. And so, as the plates are passed, take a piece of bread. When we have all received the bread, we will eat together. Let's pray and give thanks. God, we give you our thanks today for your son Jesus, your only begotten son, that you did not withhold him, but you freely gave him for us all. Each one of us who has received Christ as Savior has received the forgiveness of sins. We understand what a great gift we have been given. And as we take the bread and the cup together today, may you increase our love for you. May you increase our faithfulness to you because of what we remember today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
often sing songs without thinking about the words. But think about what we just sung. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. The only plea we have, the only hope we have, is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Not a matter of being a good person, doing good works, coming to church, reading our Bible. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in God's sight. The only hope and plea we have is the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us. So we take the bread today and we remember the body of Jesus given for us. Father, what a sobering thing it is to think that we have no hope but you. It reminds us that we are totally dependent on you. But we can still rejoice because we know we can trust you. You are a faithful God, full of forgiveness. And I thank you that you called each one of us to yourself. I thank you for the blood of Jesus given for us. And as we drink the cup today, may we remember the great forgiveness offered through your son Jesus. Amen. Jesus gave the cup to his disciples. They were used to the idea that God was the one who would give wine to drink. Jesus changed the words they were so used to and said that the cup would represent a covenant, a commitment he was making through his blood. They didn't understand it at the time, but later they reflected and they understood that we are bound eternally to our Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as the plates are passed, take a cup, and when everyone has received one, we will all drink together. Throughout the Old Testament, the Jews would offer sacrifices. They'd take bulls or goats or doves and they'd sacrifice them, shed their blood. But Hebrews tells us that all the blood of the bulls and goats, all the sacrifices, never took away sin. They were simply memorials looking forward to the day when Jesus would die as the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So we take the cup and we remember the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Father, we are so grateful for your great salvation, and today we proclaim the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we look forward to the day soon when you will come back for us so that we can be with you forever. What a joy it is to take communion together as a body. Even as Christians all across the world today may be remembering you by this memorial you've given to us. So I thank you for the chance to celebrate your great forgiveness. In Jesus' name.
Shall we pray together? Father, what a joy it is to be able to use the breath that you have given to us to give you praise, to sing your praise, to share with others your great salvation, to share with others the way that you work in our lives and you answer prayer. Sadly, many times, if we're very honest, we know many times we take the breath that you give us and we use our tongues and our breath to speak about things that are not honoring to you. And so, Lord, we want to be reminded today that we want everything we say and do and everything we eat and drink, may we do it all to the glory of God. Because, Lord, we understand that you are God. And you deserve all the praise that we could ever give you. And Father, today as we come to your word, I thank you that you have not left us without your word, but that we have it so readily available to us. But Lord, even as we come and read the words on the page, we need the help of your Holy Spirit to turn the light on for us, to, to give us insight, to give us illumination, understanding, and what the stories of Paul and Barnabas mean for us today. So Lord, speak to each one of us today, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, fifth book of the New Testament. We have spent a couple months working our way through this transitional book, and we've still got a number of weeks left to go. Picks up where the Gospels leave off. Jesus is crucified, risen, ascended. The Holy Spirit comes upon believers, empowering them to go out and share the message of good news. We call that the Gospel, a word that simply means good news. The good news is that because of what Jesus did for us, paying the penalty of our sins, we don't have to pay the penalty ourselves. We've just celebrated communion together. We remember that Jesus bore the wrath of God for our sin so that we could receive his righteousness. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and that truly is good news. Lest we ever forget, the message the early church had is the same message we have today. And the Holy Spirit who empowered Peter and Philip and Paul and Barnabas is the same Holy Spirit who lives within each one of us who has trusted Christ as Savior. The God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And so we saw that the believers were called to take this good news to Jerusalem. They started where they were. They started at home. Then they went to Judea, their neighbors. And then to Samaria, those who were a little bit different, but with a similar background, similar understanding of the scriptures. Finally, to the uttermost part of the earth. Those with no biblical knowledge. Those from idol-worshiping backgrounds. And so we see the record of the spread of the gospel here in the book of Acts. And we pick up the story today in Acts chapter 14. We saw in Acts 13 a strong Gentile church. Uh, Gentile means non-Jew. So uh, a, a strong church established north of Israel in the country called Syria in a city called Antioch. It was a multi-ethnic church. It embraced people of all different backgrounds. It was a church that truly built disciples, not just seeing people get saved, but following them up with strong teaching and training. And it was a sending church. The Holy Spirit placed a call upon Paul and Barnabas and said, separate them for the ministry I've called them to. And so they leave Antioch to go to other cities to share the good news, and they followed faithfully. Now let me refresh your memory about something that you have probably forgotten about. Back before the days of cell phones or Blu-ray players, we had this cutting edge invention called a slide projector. <laughs> or eight millimeter movies. Uh, the eight millimeter movie projector. My dad loved taking pictures. He wasn't good at it, he cut off a lot of heads, or he'd zoom in on the flower in the background and miss the family in the foreground and so watching his slideshows was sometimes humorous but can you remember the day of travelogues 
Uh, many times it's somebody who comes and wants to share about uh, a, a trip that they're promoting. They show slides of a certain area. I remember as a boy often going to the sportsman club as different hunters would come and show you all about their trip out to the great northwest and all the trophy uh, big worm sheep that they bagged. But in churches we would gather together and missionaries would come and they would show slides to let home churches see what they had been up against, the highs and lows of their ministry. I mean, it's amazing now. We get emails and, you know, we'll get an, an email from Kim Cohn and Kim and Jan will send a little video clip all the way across the world and we get it right here. But it used to be that we had to wait for the missionary to come back. And that was such a highlight as we would get uh, news, good news about their ministry. Here in Acts chapter 14, if you look down in verse 26, we'll come back to the beginning, but we're going to see where we end up. We see Par Paul and Barnabas shared just that type of report of their ministry with the sending church at Antioch. It says here in verse 26, From Italia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So Paul and Barnabas have been sent separated by the Holy Spirit for the special missionary journey. We saw in 13. It will, Paul will actually go on three different journeys. This is his first missionary journey. They end up uh, really probably taking, we don't know the exact time frame, but probably at least a year on this missionary journey. And then they come back home. They share all the stories with the church in Antioch of all the things God has done for them. They let them see how God has been at work. And so what we find here in uh, chapter 14 is the content of that travel log. The last time we saw Paul and Barnabas, they, were at, they started in chapter 13 at home. They went to the island of Cyprus, which was the home of Barnabas. They went through the island, and God gave them many opportunities to share the good news. But Satan threw strong opposition against them. We saw that the Roman proconsul, the governor of the whole island, invited them to come and hear the good news of the gospel. And God did an amazing work there. From the island of Cyprus, they travel north and go up into what we call today the nation of Turkey. Back then, it was called the nation of Asia Minor. And so, as they go up into Turkey, their companion, John Mark, goes back home. We don't know exactly why he leaves. There's different ideas of why he left. But then they go on to another Antioch. This one, not Antioch, which is the, the city in Syria, but a city in Turkey. So, it's often called Pisidian Antioch because it's in the region of Pisidia in Turkey. So just like in the U.S., I mean, there are several states uh, have towns of the same name. You know, Springfield's in like 36 states. Actually, uh, anybody know what the most common one is? Riverside. 46 states have a region called Riverside. So, there are two different Antiochs. One in Syria, that's their home church, the sending church. This one, they go up uh, in Pisidian Antioch. Paul delivers his first recorded sermon. Uh, in the end of chapter 13, he lays a, a beautiful overview of the Old Testament and how God had prophesied about sending his Messiah and how it points to the good news of Christ's salvation. Many believe the word of God spreads through the whole region. But Satan raises up opposition, and they end up moving on. So this brings us now to ch chapter 14. It's sort of like the beginning of Charles Dickens' work, A Tale of Two Cities, where it says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Uh, today we're going to look at a tale of three cities, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and we see highs and lows of ministry. These are all cities in Turkey, or Asia Minor, as it's called back then. Uh, so we end chapter 13 with them traveling about 90 miles southeast from Antioch to Iconium. This is where we pick up the story in chapter 14. 
And uh, we're going to do a little bit different sermon today as we go through this chapter. I'm going to offer more of a running commentary. You remember when uh, missionaries would come for their travelogue shows, each slide they'd comment on a little bit. So as we go through the chapter, we'll offer some comments as we go through. So we start out at verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. So in Iconium, even though this is a Gentile city, there is a strong colony of Jews who have a synagogue. Paul and Barnabas went right to it because the Jews were already familiar with the scripture, the Old Testament scriptures. And so they valued the truth about God. Paul and Barnabas began with the most natural contact that they had. So here's one, one key rule of witnessing. Start right where you are with the most natural contact. Uh, we see that's how they started the journey. They say, well, where are we going to go? Let's go back to our home. And they go to Cyprus first. They start in familiar territory. Now as they're here in Iconium, they start with the most logical place, the Jewish synagogue. The temple was down in Jerusalem, but anywhere that 10 Jewish men gathered, they could form a synagogue where uh, the equivalent of our church, where they would gather, they would worship God, they would read the scriptures together, they would pray. And any time there was a visiting rabbi show up, they'd invite them to speak. So Paul would come, and he's a Jewish rabbi, and say, well, Brother Paul, share a word of encouragement for us. And Paul was only too glad to share with them. He had an open door for ministry. So how would Paul have witnessed here in Iconium? He would have used the Old Testament scriptures, what we saw back in chapter 13. He'd use the Old Testament scriptures, which they're already familiar with. They already know these scriptures. And he would have shown them that Jesus is the promised Old Testament Messiah. Which points out to us then, you know, what was Paul's favorite tool to witness the Jews? The Old Testament. How would we do if we had to talk to somebody Jewish about the Old Testament and point out Jesus in the Old Testament? Uh, a month ago, we had Dr. Richard Flashman with us and pointed out a number of scriptures in the Old Testament that talked about Jesus being the Messiah. But far too often we say, you know, you know, I just like the New Testament. I like to read the book of Philippians and just hear about that joy. It just warms my heart. But if we really want to be able to understand the New Testament, we need to go back and read and study and learn the Old Testament. That was Paul's favorite witnessing tool, the Old Testament. And as a result of Paul's preaching, many became Christians. That's what it means when it says a great number of Jews and Gentiles believe. They're not only just listening attentively, being nice. They actually are converted. They come to faith because they see, you know what? He is right. Jesus is the Messiah. This is the one we have been waiting for. And they accept the message and their lives are changed. Then on to verse 2. Where God is at work, Satan gives opposition. It says, but the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. We see this pattern throughout the book of Acts. Uh, the gospel is shared with the Jews, but when they refuse to leave, Paul will go across the street and he'll meet somewhere in somebody's house. And he takes the gospel then to the Gentiles. The word here, refuse to believe, is literally the word unpersuadable. It's not just that they didn't believe, but there is no way. They wouldn't even give it a chance to hear it. They, they cut him off. They would not even listen to what he had to say. And these people stirred up the Gentiles who were present and poisoned their minds against them. Literally caused their minds to think evil. So these Jews, don't even tell me, I don't want to hear it. And they got everybody to say, that Paul, he is evil. Don't you listen to a word he says. So the, here is fierce opposition. How could they do that? Easily, because people love to think evil about other people. We love to hear something bad about somebody. If somebody wants to tell us about how, how, how good somebody is and all the wonderful things they've done, we think, well, I don't know. I know this about them. And we love to focus on the negative about people. Uh, it's amazing how quickly people fall for all sorts of conspiracy theories. 
And one of the, the perfect examples of that is President Obama. Uh, did I think President Obama was a good president? No. Did I pray for him? Yes, I did. But I would say half or two-thirds of the things people say about him are completely unfounded. Did you know that President Obama had, secretly had a Muslim mosque in the White House? And all these conspiracy theories people come up with. Where they come up with them, I don't know. But people here are passing on rumors, spre spreading evil about Paul and Barnabas. Verse 3. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. So what were the miraculous signs and wonders? We aren't given a record of exactly what they were, but we know throughout the scriptures that we see God does amazing things that cause people to be in awe and say this is only done by the hand of God. They're not just small magic tricks. They are things of such an extraordinary nature that those who see them understand that this is the power of God at work. And yet it's important to realize that even when God shows his power in unexplainable ways, there is no way they can explain it apart from the power of God, there's still some who still will not be, believe. They refuse to believe. It's easy to say, boy, you know, if only I could do these great miracles like Paul, boy, then everybody I witnessed to would believe. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Because even when Paul does these wonders, they still will not believe. Remember the story of Lazarus in Luke 16. Uh, the rich man dies, goes to hell. He wants somebody to come warn his family. And the answer is given. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So the city of Iconium is divided. Some believe, some don't. But never focus just on the sensational. Focus in just being a faithful witness to God. Because we understand that God does the work. We can save no one. It's only God who can save the soul. We can do our part to point people to Christ, but the converting is God's part to play. But here's another lesson for us to learn. Don't run from a challenge. Paul and Barnabas didn't run when the work got hard, but they stayed there in spite of the obstacles. Henry Ford said, obstacles are those frightful things you see when you take your eyes off the goal. And how very true that is. We can focus on the problems or we can focus on our God. Whenever we focus on the problems, we get discouraged, we get defeated, we want to give up. When we focus on the power of our God, we are encouraged and excited, empowered, energized. So going to verse 5. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to, to ill-treat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lycaonian cities of Lystra and Derbe, and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. So, we said Paul and Barnabas stuck it out, but now we see them leaving. Are they leaving because of opposition? No. They were using wise common sense and being guided by the Spirit of God. There are times where we will face physical attack. Uh, when we get here to Lystra, we'll see that uh, they end up stoning Paul. But, don't foolishly place yourself in harm's way. There are far too many Christians who invite trouble because they are arrogant and proud. And they, they're proud about being a martyr for Christ. Wow, well, I just spoke the truth. But many times it's foolish choices Christians make that bring trouble upon them. Paul said, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul looked for every opportunity to share, but he remembers Jesus had instructed his disciples, if people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So Paul and Barnabas have seen a divided ministry here. Some have believed, some have not. Contention is stirred up. They leave and they go to Lystra. 
Lystra is 18 miles southwest of Iconium. Lystra's population, though, consisted of Roman military veterans. It's basically a retirement center for the army. So here there is not a Jewish synagogue. It's a Roman town. So what do you do now? There's no obvious place to begin. These are pagan, idol-worshiping Gentiles with no background of the Old Testament scriptures. So Paul, guided by God's Spirit, looks for an open door for interaction. He comes into town, and here in verse 8, we see he finds someone to start the discussion. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. The fact of his being crippled from birth is important because it shows that the healing was real. Everybody in town would have known this man. He's been crippled ever since we knew him. Sometimes when people conduct healing services, they, they heal people from headaches or things that there's no way to prove whether or not they were healed. Or, uh, I remember once... Uh, when we were in Fort Wayne, there was a woman in the church who had terrible bumps all over her face. And she said, well, God healed me. And I said, well, Glenda, you still have the bumps. She said, well, I just don't think about them anymore. When God healed, he healed perfectly. This man stands up and walks around because he's healed because of his faith. When we look in the Gospels, we see the one place Jesus didn't do miracles was in Nazareth his hometown. Why not? It says he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So here is a man who has faith. Paul sees that. He responds to what God is doing and God provides a great healing. And the whole town takes notice. Look at how they respond. Verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So you think, wow, this is really a unique response of the people. We need to understand a little bit of the background of the city. The people of Lystra had a legend that years before, the gods Zeus and Hermes had come down to the town and disguised themselves as ordinary travelers. No one in the land offered them hospitality except two old peasants named Philemon and Baucis, and as a result, the whole population was wiped out except the two peasants. So with that experience in mind, here come Paul and Barnabas. They're doing these miraculous signs, and what do the people think? Zeus and Hermes have come back again. And we're not going to get wiped out like we did last time. We're going to acknowledge them. So when Paul and Barnabas are doing these great miracles, uh, they begin to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Since Paul was the chief speaker, he was seen as Hermes, which is the Greek version. The Roman version is the god Mercury, the messenger of the gods. Zeus would be Jupiter, in Roman mythology, the head of the gods, and so uh, maybe Barnabas had a little bit older appearance, and so they thought, well, if Paul's a speaker, he's Hermes, then this guy, Barnabas, he's got to be Zeus. Zeus was the patron deity of the city, so, so the priest comes out right away. This is a great chance to offer praises to their gods who have come to visit among them. Verse 14, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting. So why didn't Paul and Barnabas pick up on this right away? Because back in verse 11, we see that, that they were shouting in their local dialect, their Lycaonian speech. And the common language of the day was Koine Greek. They, they, everybody spoke Greek, but these people were spoken, speaking their native dialect, so it took a while until Paul and Barnabas could figure out what's going on here. And so when they do, they're tearing their clothes, they're saying, don't worship us focus on Christ don't worship us we're not gods is it really such a big deal to be praised yes it is because back in Acts chapter 12 two chapters before we saw an incident with Herod 
The people came out uh, when Herod was speaking, and, they, and the people shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. So Paul and Barnabas aren't about to be struck down by God. They're not going to take the, the glory of God. God says, I will not share my glory with another. So as they're praising Paul and Barnabas to be gods, they're saying, no, we're just men. We're just men. Verse 15. Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. So Paul tells them to turn from these worthless things to the one true God. He's saying, you know, all these idols, Zeus, uh, Hermes, they're worthless. Don't worship idols. There is one true God. So Paul is, takes this opportunity to tell them about the one true God. Sort of like we'll see later when he's there and gives a speech on Mars Hill. And he says, you've got all these shrines, all these different gods, but you've got one to the own, unknown God. Let me tell you about him. So as they are trying to worship Paul and Barnabas, Paul goes on to tell them about the one true God. He says, these are things that are plain to you if you would have taken the time to consider. First, he shows that behind creation... There is one living God. Not a multitude of all these deities and gods and demigods. There is one God. The second point he makes is that the one God permits men free choice. Therefore, men have the opportunity to do evil. He allows the nations to walk their own way. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, we see that with the Jews. That God sends prophets to call them, but he allows them to go their way and then judgment falls. People cry out to God. God raises up the livers and they worship for a while. Then they fall away. The book of Judges is just filled with cycles like that. So God allows them to go their own way. But third, God will not allow it to go too far. Even when man goes his own way, God shows his love to mankind. God has shown his love by giving rain and fruit and harvest and gladness and joy and happiness. That's the God that Paul preached to them. A loving, powerful, caring God who is watching over the Lycaonians who wanted to make himself known to them. So even as Paul declares this one God to them, the people still want to worship Paul and Barnabas. The next slide in Paul's travelogue, Satan enters, brings opposition. Verse 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered round him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. So these Jews are coming from Pisidian Antioch, 130 miles away, just so they can stir up contention and cause problems for Paul. They've probably traveled a whole week, six or seven days to get there, just to stand against Paul. Many times, Satan works like that. You're, you're sharing with a friend and, and sharing the gospel with them, and you're getting to the point where you want to see them re come to a decision, and somebody comes and rings the doorbell at their house, and suddenly there's, here's a friend visiting, and, and the, the moment is ruined. So many times, Satan brings some obstacle in. That's one of the reasons why when we go out, it's great to go out two by two, because one person can sort of manage obstacles. If there's kids who are interfering, they can sort of keep the kids happy or, well, or be praying for, for the other one who's sharing and talking. Satan loves to throw opposition to the gospel. It shouldn't surprise us. When these Jews bring opposition, they stone Paul. They think they've killed him. But notice what revives him. Verse 20, the support of other brothers and sisters in Christ. When we are feeling defeated and discouraged, ready to give up, so many times God will bring a brother or sister in Christ along to encourage us, to have us rekindled in our faith. I love the story of David and Jonathan when 
David is out running for his life. Saul is trying to kill him. It says that, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him to find strength in God. Jonathan doesn't just come and say, Oh, it'll be okay, David. He points him to God and says, God is with you, David. And when we seek to encourage others, don't just say, Oh, things will all work out. Point them to God. Point them to the power that God has to help them. And when we think about praying for missionaries, as I said before, don't just say, oh, Lord, bless all the missionaries. Pray specifically for them. Be specific in your prayers for them. So Paul is strengthened. He goes back into the city to show that Satan has not won the battle. But then Paul travels 60 miles to Derby. He has faced opposition in Iconium. He's faced opposition in Lystra. But notice in verse 21 what happens in Derby. It says they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Think about what would have happened if Paul said, you know, we just were at Iconium and they stood against us. We were just at Lystra and they stoned us. Let's head home. He would have completely missed the harvest at Derby. <coughs> Excuse me. We give up far too easily. Satan gets us discouraged and we give up and we miss so many of the blessings of God because we never get to the Derby. We get stuck at the Iconium and Lystra and never make it to Derby. In the Old Testament, in the wilderness wanderings, the Jews are grumbling because there's no water. They come to a place, they call it Mara, because the water there was bitter. And they're grumbling and complaining. But after they leave Mara, right on the other side is the oasis of Elam, nine miles down the road. It's an oasis that had 12 springs and 70 palm trees. God brings us to the Maras in life, the times of testing, the times of disappointment, Times when things don't work out good to test our hearts. But when we come through the Mars of life, God has a Palm Springs right down the road for us. We so many times never get to the place of blessing because we give up in the time of testing. The pathway of blessing is through the obstacle of trials. And in those trials, God wants us to learn that we can trust him. But we give up far too easily. Not Paul. He has come through Iconium, come through the stoning at Lystra, he's gone to Derby, and now he sees a large number trust Christ. Uh, a great triumph of ministry. You can almost imagine as Paul is back home sharing his travel log as he shares that, everybody in the church at, at Antioch of Syria say, oh, amen, praise the Lord. Excited because God has overcome. Because Paul was faithful. Archaeologists have uh, found inscriptions that show that there were many bishops who came from Derby. One of them was actually present at the Council of Constantinople in 381. So Paul's efforts in this town were not in vain. And they weren't short-lived because the people there established a church and it was a leading church for many, many centuries to come. Following a successful evangelistic campaign, the missionaries backed track through all the cities they've just been through on the missionary journey. The goal was to strengthen the believers and establish the churches in those areas. Verse 21. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with fasting and with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So on the return trip home, Paul and Barnabas go back through each of the towns they've been to before because they don't want to just go home and just report, oh, we had these, this many salvation decisions. They weren't just notches on their belt. They were concerned that they continue in the faith. And so they teach them, they encourage them, they warn them, be prepared for hardships as part of the life. Being a Christian doesn't save you out of hardship, but rather God will bring you through the hardship. And then they make the return visits, they make their way back home, verse 24. After going through Pisidia, they came back into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia, 
from Adalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So Paul and Barnabas return home. They share the exciting stories of victory and opposition, highs and lows of ministry, and they take a time to be refreshed. They don't know what God has in store for them next. Uh, we know from reading the scripture, God's going to continue to use them greatly. But they will be ready when God shows them. Ministry can be exciting and empowering, but it can also be exhausting. So they take time to be refreshed. That's why missionaries will take times of furlough. Not just to come home and report, but also times to be refreshed. One of our missionary families, Bruce and Janine Coker, are at, the, at a position of transition in their ministry. They have been serving over in Uganda for a number of years. They felt that they have finished the work that God has called them to in Uganda. They are back home in Michigan right now, uh, taking a time for transition, a time for refreshing. And then uh, later on, the end of the summer, they're going to be, head, or actually early fall, they'll be heading down to the Dominican Republic to start a new ministry. They're actually going to be with us in August to share in person about this new ministry that God is calling them to. And so I'm sure that you'll want to be here to hear from them firsthand when they're with us. And then one more quick side note is uh, during this time of refreshing at Antioch, many people feel is the time that Paul writes his letter to the church of Galatia. Uh, the book of the Bible we call the book of Galatians. And where is Galatia? The very region he's just been in. So Paul, write, Paul gets back home to Antioch in Syria, and he writes this letter to these new baby Christians to help them with the issues they may be struggling in, to give them encouragement. God does amazing things through us when we make ourselves available to him. Today we've seen the travelogue of Paul, but in the same way that Paul shared with the church back home, we bless and encourage one another as we share with one another the good things God is doing. That's why it's important that we don't just come out for a worship service, but that we take time to talk to one another. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. We share the good things that God is doing in our lives. And so we pray that God will continue to use us for his glory. At this time, uh, David and Anna are with us, and we want to commend them to the grace of God, just as we've seen uh, the church at Antioch do. So David and Anna, I'm going to ask you to come forward here. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different today. Would you come right in this aisle right here? And I'm going to ask you as a church body, if you would get up out of your seats and come. And uh, in Scripture we see that often when a blessing was imparted, hands were laid on people. Not that there's anything magical about the laying on of hands, but it is an acknowledgement that we are seeking God's blessing upon David and Anna and their children as they head down to Brazil to work with the Yanomami people. And so we want to pray for them together today. We'll wait till everybody can gather in. If you can't reach them, you'll reach the person in front of you. <laughs> and let's all pray together. Father, I thank you for David and Anna, for the salvation you've blessed them with for the joy in their spirit, for the work of your Holy Spirit preparing them, bringing them together so that they will go as a team. And Lord, I know that even as they go, Satan will provide opposition, even as we've seen in your word today. But whenever Satan provides opposition, you always provide a way to victory. And so Lord, we pray for David and Anna that you would keep them from being discouraged and defeated. Help them to get to the place of Derby. Help them to get through the trials to the place of great blessing. Lord, we commend them to your grace, your unmerited favor, your great blessing. We pray that your great blessing would be upon their lives and their ministry because they are seeking this not for their glory, but for your glory. So as they go and they leave us, we commit to continue to pray for them and to provide for them. And Lord, I pray that our faithful support would be a blessing to them. So Lord, we commit them to your grace today. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll have the praise team come and lead us in one more song. Why don't we stand as we sing about that good, good Father that provides everything for us.
pray. Father, you are a good, good Father. You are so faithful to us in every day. You shower us with, you load us down with your blessings. I thank you, Lord, that there's not a thing that we go through, but that you know about it, and you are there with us. And Lord, even as we've just sung, you call us into love, love, love. Mm -hmm. Every problem, every trial we face is a chance for you to show your love for us and your care for us. And in turn, we want to give you all the praise and the glory. I thank you for the chance to worship you corporately. And now as we go our separate ways, dismiss us with your blessing and use us to declare your praises to others throughout this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.